have invocation tonight from Perry Baptist Church at Immigrants. <laughs> Let's pray. Uh, Lord, we do thank you for uh, the opportunity to come together and uh, freedom and, and democracy to uh, see the, what's best for the city. I pray that as we do that, uh, that Lord, we would thank with uh, the benefit of all in mind that we could have uh, your wisdom and that decisions would be made and that would be best for the community and uh, best benefit for the citizens, Lord. We thank you for everything you do for us. We ask your blessing in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I think it's 7 o'clock, at least my new glasses tell me it is. So we will call the meeting to order and have the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God. Council members Craig Elliott and Terry Wood. Both Craig and Terry did give us a call uh, previously, one earlier this week and one today, to say they wouldn't be here. So I'm glad everybody else made it. We're looking for approval now of the agenda. I move the agenda be adopted as printed. Second. Been moved and seconded that the agenda be approved. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Was that Lambert and Grass? I'm sorry. Yes, Lambert and Grass. And now reading and approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. I move that we suspend the rules, waive the reading and approve the minutes from the January 21st, 2021 regular meeting. Second. Then moved and seconded that we waive the, that we approve the minutes and waive the reading. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We'll jump down to, um, 
pre-approved reports because we have time before it's time for the public hearing. Um, Leland, <coughs> would you like to um, say anything about your proposal? Or were you planning to do that? I hadn't planned to. Uh, okay. Something you want me to say, I will, but I didn't the, What I'm asking Leland about, he had um, pr provided me with his suggestion to try to put something in the ordinance for zoning administration to give them some authority to follow follow through on residents who aren't complying with ordinances, be it signs or be it um, election signs or whatever the case may be. And we've sent out a request to the attorney, the city attorney, to give us an opinion on that to find out what we can do. I did get one brief reply from him, but I've asked him some more questions, so we don't really have uh, something, you know, substantiated from him yet. So we'll just keep that um, up in the air for now, I guess, until we hear from him. Okay. The uh, next thing would be public comments, and, and we can go to that, certainly. We don't start the public hearing until 7.15. So does anybody here have public comments they'd like to make other than regarding the um, special assessment hearing? There's nobody raising their hand on Zoom either. Nobody virtually either. Okay. You're making this a short meeting. <laughs> we'll go to communications. Devin, do we have some? I don't believe so. Um, the only thing that I would make sure council um, received the um, attorney information. Um, there was a packet that was given to you. And that's all I have for tonight. I would like um, just to raise one matter that's been troublesome for some time. Off and on, we have received in the mail letters from people who raise questions or concerns about things going on here in the in the government offices but the letters have never been signed they've never had a return address so council is concerned about that we'd like to be able to communicate with people if they have concerns so i've been asked just to read this regarding those types of letters. If you have concerns about officials in our government offices, it's not only your right, but your duty to report it with evidence to support it and to identify yourself and provide options for response. Thank you. It's also been suggested through an email to me that perhaps every month we offer a open town meeting kind of discussion time. Council, what would you think about the idea of having a old-fashioned town hall meeting for, say, 30 minutes? prior to the second meeting every month. So we would gather at 6.30. Anyone from the community could then come, ask questions, ask for discussion regarding anything. We wouldn't put any limit on the time for that discussion, but we would end at five minutes to seven, have our invocation, and then go ahead with the meeting. What are your thoughts on that? I think that's a good thought. 
I'm wide open to give it a try and see what we'll go. If it gathers a lot of interest and we have a lot of people who come, uh, we could always expand the time, you know, and start earlier. But I think starting at 6.30 is a good place to begin. What do you think, Adam? Yeah, that's fun. What do you think, Bob? I'm not opposed to it, but they have public comment already in the city council. So uh, I don't want it to become a come in here and yell at us for 30 minutes because if you're not going to put a timeline on it, that, that's me what it may end up being. But think, I'm all for openness and getting people here and um, interacting with their community government. They, that's the only way we're going to work for them if they come in and talk to us. Well, that's what we'll try. in other ways, yeah. mail, email, yeah. whatever, phone. We, we do have the uh, technology committee working on other ideas for communication, but we can try this. Um, it won't be written in stone, so if it doesn't work out, we'll just stop. So uh, we might lay some ground rules, but uh, rudeness and shouting uh, accusations without evidence, that kind of stuff won't be tolerated. So. Okay, so we will start with that um, next meeting. So we'll gather at 6.30 for an open town hall. Just note we don't have a full council, so you'll be served that information for the special. It will be considered a special. So I believe I'll be able to comply with your packets being it's the same day, but I'll verify that. You actually have to have a special meeting today? Mm -hmm. You're having a corn. Yeah. Okay. And you're asking people to talk about subjects in the city, so you are discussing city business that you're opening up to the public, so I'd rather be safe than sorry. I agree. John, do you think you can do your report um, in five minutes? You want to try? <laughs> okay. So uh, we, we're dealing with the ordinance of the uh, Orchard Street. Yeah. Is that the one? Okay. So um, we. I don't know what all information you guys have seen, but historically what we had done in the past um, when, you know, buildings were demolished or just prior to them, the services had to be disconnected um, physically from the city's uh, service. So the service lines would remain and um, they would have to continue paying the, what I call the ready to serve rate or the base rate. Um, the question was posed to council uh, since the house was uninhabitable um, and, and myself and they weren't satisfied that's why you guys got involved in that with this discussion um, and it ended up going to the city attorney for a legal breakdown we were not wrong in our interpretation but we were not able to fully um, justify it in a court of law. I'll, I'll just say that. Um, so they have now petitioned and asked for a disconnect or to be capped. Um, they will not have to pay the benefit charge. We were, uh, because if you follow the ordinance as a flow chart, um, but certain ordinances or certain uh, provisions didn't, they went from one to the next, but they didn't go to the next one to, to do that. So they will end up having to pay, you know, any connection fees that we would incur, uh, new water meters, that type of stuff, uh, and, and any of the uh, components on the city side uh, in addition, and then they would have to reconnect and pay for it from that point. Wherever it's terminated, it doesn't always necessarily end in the right of way. Um, uh, typically the water does, the sewer, we mark it, stake it, 
know the location of its last known disconnect. So if that clears things somewhat <laughs> without. And this, this is in regard to the Frisches, uh, who Alan and Shauna Frisch, who wrote us a letter uh, that we discussed last week. And we asked John to look into that. John, Mindy, and I met and talked about it and decided to ask the attorney to interpret that Correct. ruling because it was a little bit vague. And typically, the reason why uh, we would go all the way back to a complete disconnect is normally when a building's tore down uh, and they don't give me or public works a time frame that they don't intend on rebuilding. Uh, there has been instances where they wanted, they asked for a permanent disconnect. We went back to the main and as far back as um, possible and terminated the sewer leads. I'm not going to dig up the road and uh, end the Y at the Y there. So it was left in the right of way. We still have the addresses, the markings for any f future misdig uh, situations. So that doesn't get bored into or hit. We will still mark it. But, um, so that's any any questions for John about that or any any other questions regarding that interpretation from the attorney? If not, I'll go ahead and sign the letter that the attorney has sent us and we'll put that in the mail to the Frisches tomorrow. It's now 715 and we will move ahead to public hearing regarding the special assessment for ambulance service. And uh, Fire Chief Guy Hubbard's here. He will answer any questions or at least be available to answer any questions that anyone might have. This is a hearing. You're welcome to step to the podium and ask a question, make a statement, anything regarding that special assessment for ambulance service. Yes, please tell us your name and where, where you live. My name is Stephen Wallace. I live on 431 Northeast Street here in Perry. Yep. I'm here tonight to voice my opposition to the special assessment uh, to recover cost for the ambulance service. During this troubled time with the pandemic, you're asking many people uh, to sacrifice even more with a special tax. Don't burden our residents. It does not appear to me that this is uh, councils being transparent to our residents. First of all, the cost of this special assessment is not listed on the letter that was sent to the residents. It does say that you can come to City Hall to see it. <clears throat> it's not on the website either, the city's website. <clears throat> this should be brought to the vote of the people at an election. They did it in, I believe, Weberville this year, or this last year, and it passed. The assessment should have a date certain to end instead of being reoccurring. By reoccurring an increase at about 10% in 10 or 15 years, the Fire and Ambulance Service will have a better revenue than the city of Perry. I'd also like to know about private ambulance services. Lansing Mason, Lansing Mercy, MMR. They make a profit and they're, they're sustainable. The first thing you see when you go to the fire department's website is how to pay your ambulance bill. <clears throat> I ask and urge the city council to take a step back, reassess, and put a millage request on a ballot in front of the people. Let them decide if they can afford or wish to fund this request. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boss. Anybody else have any comments related to the ambulance special assessment? My name is Jeremiah Sayer, 503 Perry Lake Drive, right here in town. Um, Fairly new resident to the city of Perry, uh, four years in the city. Um, when we purchased our home, uh, I realized the taxes were a bit high. Um, 
considering the infrastructure that I see around. Um, I work in an infrastructure department. I know quite a little bit about it. Uh, also know a little bit about the cost of maintenance and the cost of services. Um, being from a very small town in northern Michigan, I kind of understand how things operate and run. Although my wife and I were committed, we really love the community. Love everything about the people here. Uh, reminds me a lot of up north, but I'm not there. Um, to be honest with you, I, I pay probably some of the highest taxes in the city of Perry. Um, I've done my homework. I came to the Board of Appeals this past year. was given a very clear explanation of why, which I'm agreeing with. Uh, I can't afford any more, though. And I feel like a lot of our residents are probably in a similar boat. Just as Mr. Wallace said, I second that opinion that we should go to a vote and we should allow our Perry residents to decide that. I think the ambulance service is incredibly important and I would never want to lose it. I feel like most of the residents here feel the same and we'd probably step up and do what was necessary. But I couldn't agree more with Mr. Wallace. Uh, this is not transparent at all. I don't even know what 10% of anything is. Is it 10% of a million? Is it 10% of $10? I have no clue and no way to find out. And it's not clear in this letter how I would find out. And it's not also clear in this letter when it's going to happen. So we have to understand, you know, as city council members and people that deal with this all the time, the general population doesn't. And I'm part of that general population. And I'm a younger person. And I want to know where my money's going. Um, I really want to stay in this town. But if I'm going to pay the taxes I pay, I'll move closer to Lansing. And I feel like a lot of people will. There's not jobs here. We drive one way or the other. We've moved out here to get away. And I really hate to have to move closer. So I know that this, this is, uh, you know, the ball's rolling in a direction where we're all being nickel and dime for everything. Our gas bills, our light bills. And I know that's not the problem of this community, but it's a problem for all of us. We have to stop at some point, reassess, and make sure we're doing what's best for our community to stay a small community. Otherwise, it's it's not going to go well for us, I don't believe. So, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else? Guy, do you I have some go now. information for us? <laughs> Can I take this off or should I leave it on? Can we have a problem this off? Anyone? I think you're six feet away. I'm six feet away from everybody you should have asked. Hard to breathe. Uh, my name is Guy Hubbard. I'm the uh, Emergency Services Chief of Perry Area Fire Rescue, Southwest Shiawassee Emergency Services Alliance, whatever. Um, the, the city of Perry and all the municipalities that we cover have been paying $45 per unit. Now, a unit is a household or an apartment or a business is one unit for every five full-time employees. So McDonald's probably pays for three units or whatever. I don't know. Um, and that's calculation by the city clerk or the city treasurer. I'm not sure which one who does that. But, um, and we're proposing going to $65 per unit. So it's a $20 increase. The, I, I, I should take notes while the two of you are speaking because I understand your concerns. I live in the city too. So, um, the, uh, the 10 percent, potential increase of 10 percent per year has always been a part of the assessment. And the assessment for the city of Perry went from $30 to $45 in 2001. And we've kept it that way. We started in 2005. The previous service that covered uh, the city of Perry was PMSA. They were, uh, I guess you call them partially private ambulance companies. Perry Morris Shasburg Ambulance. Um, they collected 30, they requested to go to 45 and did for, for all the municipalities again. And when we started in January 2005, we kept it that way. So it's been $45 per unit for 20 years. Um, and we just can't sustain that anymore because uh, I try to find a paramedic these days. Uh, right now, the paramedics start out at $14 an hour, and that's to save somebody's life potentially. You give drugs like doctors do and nurses do. Um, they're just not doing it anymore. People are saying, I don't want to be in a paramedic anymore, and most paramedics are in nursing school to go on to the next step, or even uh, physical or uh, any other, anything else in the medical field besides a paramedic. Um, so that's been a challenge. So we have to offer more money. 
We did get it, uh, uh, we, I think it was like 13, 15 an hour, and over the last the last 18 months, I, sh I shouldn't have said 14, I think they were 14, 15 an hour to start a paramedic. And then the races go up, I think our top medic's been there for 12 years. I want to guess he's right around 17 an hour, something like that, so he's not making very much money. And I shouldn't say that. It's a fair amount for what the industry standard is. That's, that's the bottom line. Uh, the EMTs make even less than that. <laughs> uh, and just coincidentally, not that this really is, is of concern to the residents, but we do have all state-of-the-art equipment. Unfortunately, a lot of it has to be replaced. Um, we have to buy three heart monitors. Those are $30,000 a piece. Now, I just had this meeting yesterday. I just got the bids yesterday, so that's why I have this little... Uh, we have to buy two new cots at $17,000 a piece. AEDs, the heart monitors, or the uh, automatic external defibrillator. There's one here in City Hall. That has to be replaced, by the way. Okay. Um, those are uh, before February of next year. They, uh, they, uh, um, they aren't recognized anymore. You will be able to buy pads for them anymore, batteries. Those are $1,600 a piece. I can get the City One uh, at that price. You wouldn't be able to buy it yourself that. Um, but we have to buy five of those. Uh, the city needs, you know, the school has them. Uh, we might be able to squeeze something with the school. I'm not sure we'll be able to accommodate them. Uh, we'll see. Um, and then a CPR machine. It does automatic CPR. It's just basically that I got a bid yesterday for $180,000 for equipment. Um, health insurance in 2000, Obamacare took over, and our health insurance skyrocketed. I'm sure that some of you know that. And we, again, we've been able to keep that $45 even through those times. In 2008, um, we got hit hard because of the recession. That was about the time Obamacare took, well, Obamacare was way after that. But anyway, uh, we took a pretty big hit then. Now the $45 wasn't affected, but our millage for fire was. We collected millage for fire and the assessment for ambulance, then money is kept set completely separate. Um, the fire we covered just the city of Perry, Perry Township, portion of Bennington Township and a portion of Antrim Township. And everybody pays the same millage. Um, so I get, you know, it's, it's an increase in taxes. It's $20 a year. Uh, I wanted to make the point about the 10% increase is potential. It can do that. The, the city has the right to do that based on the uh, special hearing. I think you probably just took the paperwork from 2000 and just changed it a little bit. But um, we never took advantage of that 10% throughout those 20 years. So I don't suspect we will this time either. And um, um, Mr. Wallace, <laughs> you used to be the mayor. Yes, That's sir. right, okay, okay. I've lived in Perry my whole life, so I know everybody. Um, but, uh, oh, when you go to our website and ask about paying your ambulance bill, that is, it's the unfortunate beast. Our budget for, uh, Ambulance is about $1.4 million, and just a little over half of that is the uh, assessments. We cover about um, about 12,000 households total, and three stations. Um, and what we do for what we call residents would be anyone that pays this assessment. The communities pay, but they collect however they want. And they could go to a vote. Doesn't make any difference to us how you collect the money. Um, all of them are by assessment like this, though, as an example. Um, and that would be, I know I forget something, Vernon Township, Burns Township, Antrim Township, Perry Township, City of Perry, Village of Morris, three quarters of Bennington Township. Durand. Didn't you just get Durand? Straight City of Durand. Um, there's somebody else in there, I'm sure. Um, but anyway, that would include our, that's our 12,000 households. About, about 200 square miles we cover. And it, uh, that was also brought about private EMS. That's a that's a great thing to bring up because that's a it's real. We just uh, we just started service in the city of Grand because they got tired of the private EMS and their uh, their uh, I'll say it shenanigans. Um, they do pay somewhat better, but they also bill more. If you're a resident, this is where I was getting at. If you're a resident within our community that we cover and you are unable to pay your balance of the ambulance bill. First thing goes to the insurance company. Insurance company pays whatever, if you have a deductible or a copay or whatever the case is, and you're unable to pay that. You call us, you tell us I can't pay it, we just write it off. Now, if it's somebody that lives in Lansing or outside of our coverage area, even in the city of Durand until recently, um, and you couldn't pay your bill, for whatever reason, it didn't matter, we sent you collections. 
So that's what the money gets you, I guess. Um, that, that's a good thing. Uh, and we also try to take care of the seniors, very much so. Uh, we take care of them, make sure that they, uh, um, I, don't, I really don't like sending anything to the seniors as far as billing goes. I don't think that they should have to pay for their medications or doctors, I don't think, I, but that's just me. And maybe it's because I'm getting closer to be that, that in that category, I don't know. Um, I guess that's pretty much, I had, you know, some, I just, I started writing down here, so I didn't have a whole lot prepared. But we'll get about seven hundred eighty thousand um, dollars with the twelve hundred or twelve thousand households, and that'll be a little over half our budget. The other half is questions from insurance companies. How many ambulances do you have? We have four ambulances, three stations. We have a station here in Perry, a station in Vernon Township, and a station in the city of Vernon. What's your average response time to somebody, let's say, in the city of Perry? Now, the city of Perry being so small, I'm going to see our average response time is probably around three to five minutes. Yeah. And if we didn't have our ambulance service, this ambulance service, and somebody had to call Lansing, what's that response time? I, yeah, 20, probably 20, 30 minutes. I don't know. The way, the way and this is, this is the downfall. This is what happened to PMSA, and this is 20 some years ago. Uh, if you weren't here or don't remember, the, uh, the city of Perry was one of the municipalities that PMSA covered. They, had, they, did, they weren't nearly as big as we are, but they covered several municipalities. The PMSA was somewhat private, and they, but they had a city representative on their board, just like the city of Perry does. You have two representatives, actually. Um, the city of Perry Council said, okay, we want this person to be on your board. Well, they went to the meeting, and the, the PMSA board and the rest of them said, no, we don't want you. So they kicked it back. They couldn't get financial reports uh, from PMSA, so... Uh, the city pulled their money, and the PMSA said we're not covering the city. So the city of Owasso came down to Perry for about eight months, I want to say. Um, and then they came to me one day, I think in September, and said, hey, we want you to start doing ambulance in the city of Perry, January 1st. <laughs> so, um, you know, I just used to fight, just to put uh, wet stuff on red stuff. Now I'm going to um, take people to the hospital all of a sudden. But anyway, that's the history. So. The question about not paying the assessment, the household assessment, I will never, ever say we won't cover any municipality with our ambulance, even if you don't pay. That's not going to happen. That's not the kind of service we provide. But we will be here every month begging, 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 however it takes to get that money so that it's fair to the rest of the communities that pay the money. You know, we can't do it for free here and, and charge over here. You know, can't, we just can't do that. That's not, that's not right. So everyone is going to be is is going to 65. I'm going to take 100% blame, even though I have a board that I answer to, for it not raising slowly, like maybe that 10% a year for a few years, or maybe coming here um, five years ago, eight years ago, 10 years ago, and asking from 45 to 55 or 45 to 50. Uh, but I just never did that because I think the city of Perry is the only one that ever calls me. The treasurer says, hey, uh, we're going to set our assessment. Is 45 still going to be enough? And of course, they asked me in like May, and our budget year starts in January. So, uh, like, yeah, sure, it'll be enough. It'll be enough. So we never increased it. So, uh, I, but I should have been more uh, aggressive with the board and said, hey, we need to raise this a little bit at a time. You know, um, twenty dollars a year, I get it. Twenty bucks a year—that's a half tank of gas. And uh, um, soon it won't be. It'll be a quarter tank of gas, but. Um, but anyway, that's, uh, I get that it's an increase, and it's going to be a burden to some people, especially seniors, fixed income people. And right now, with the th way things are going, the pandemic, and uh, not being able to work, and uh, it's just, it's bad timing. Uh, but the pandemic has also affected us greatly. And uh, um, there for three months, people just didn't want to go to the hospital. We'd go to their house, check them out, suggest they go to the hospital. They didn't want to go because that's where all the COVID guys were. And they didn't want to get COVID, so they didn't go. So that lowered our call volume, which lowers our revenue. Unfortunately, it's a two-sided, uh, two-edged sword. If we don't have calls, we don't have revenue, and we don't have money. So we have to have, people have to get sick, people have to get hurt. That's just the bottom line. It, uh, other than maybe going to $100 per unit, then maybe we wouldn't have to have so many calls. Um, but I, I definitely don't want that to happen. And I, it, it will not happen. 
I doubt that it'll change from the $65 per unit in, um, in 10 years. I can't say that for sure, but I would assume that that's going to get us caught up. It's going to be able to get all of our equipment to, uh, caught up where it's supposed to be. This heart monitor stuff, this came in, it's the same brand as what the city of Perry has for an AED. Uh, but this is the thing that can shock the patients and uh, I'm not a paramedic in EMT, so um, I could have brought one with me. I play one sometimes at work, but um, uh, it, it, what they've done, the, the, the state, or the federal government has actually said, okay, you have this monitor, you can't use it anymore starting February of 2022. So, wait a minute, and we have three of them, so that's 100K right there. So that's a, that's a, that's a big hit. And right now they have uh, zero financing for three years, so we're most likely going to take advantage of all that stuff. So that and then that happened yesterday. The sixty-five dollars has been discussed for a year uh, amongst our board, and we didn't even know that we were going to have to buy all this stuff this year. So we needed the money besides just uh, the new equipment purchases. So I hope that you know eases a little bit. Uh, Private ambulance company, I did talk a little bit about that, but there's no private ambulance in the company in the world that's going to come and sit in the city ferry. For, for, it costs about $430,000 a year to run an ambulance. And that's, um, that, that's for staffing, ambulance, equipment, supplies, all of those things, benefits. And, uh, and the city of Perry generates, well, $45,000 right now, because uh, there's, there's, uh, there's about 1,000 households in the city. Or units, so it's forty-five thousand dollars for that, and probably generates, um, I'm going to say, two or three hundred calls a year, uh, times an average of, uh, um, you know, average around four hundred per year or per call. You're not even halfway. You're not even. You're about a quarter of the way to affording an ambulance by yourselves. I wish that you know it could be different, but it can't. I'm not saying we're the only game in town. But if a private ambulance company did come here, they wouldn't stay here. The city of Durand, they paid a private ambulance company. But the only reason that ambulance company did it is because they were right on the county line. And they went to Genesee County all the time. So they were paying for an ambulance to sit in the city of Durand. And that, that ambulance went to Genesee County more than it did in the city of Durand. So that's why they went out. They reached out to us because we had one in Vernon Township. Reached out to us and said, hey, can you cover us? So. And to point out, I live in the city of Perry. That's everyone saying that here. What do I care what Duran does? Well, you do because that supplies, they're helping to afford or pay for other ambulances. We have three now on the road 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If the Perry truck or any of the trucks go out to a call, then the truck that's in Duran or Vernon will come over here, or at least halfway here, to take the next call if it happens to be in the city. So you're actually getting three ambulances in the city, not sitting in the city all the time, but close. Uh, so them being, us partnering with all these other municipalities is a benefit to the city. It's a benefit to all of them, not just the city. So that's, uh, if anybody has any more questions. I appreciate your comments. I, really I, I do have a question. Yeah. Out of these 12 communities that, that we serve, how many of them? 12? Is there really that? Yes, yeah. sir. I got it listed. <laughs> <laughs> Out of those 12 communities we serve, how many of them are at the $65 rate right now? Right now the city grand is. And um, the others are all going about it however it is that they can because of the, uh, their budget year, their assessment year. Um, right now, Burns Township is going through the same thing that you are. And um, they're going to be online the same time you were online. Uh, when we went to, when uh, Dur I, we just started Duran in August. So um, when I proposed the city of Duran was the 65, knowing that you were going to be shooting for that. So they're paying it already, um, but no one else is yet. Bennington's on board. Everyone has to work. We're asking that everyone be paying that by January 1st of 2022. So that's the, that's the date that we're looking at. But no one else is yet. Uh, Vernon Township will probably be before that. Vernon Township is our biggest revenue. We get $126,600 a year from Vernon Township right now at 45. We get 45 from the city of Perry. And uh, I want to say Perry Township's like eighty thousand dollars, something like that, maybe. But and if I could ask a question to council, is it a big hurry that we do this special assessment, or can't we do this the right way and put it on a ballot? 
was was that one question or two questions? <laughs> I think it was two. <laughs> I apologize. Twelve communities. Come on. I don't have that <laughs> it's put out right now because it typically goes on the summer tax bill and it has expired so we wouldn't be able to put it on the summer tax bill unless it passes unless we pass the special assessment so it would so we go a year without all election and, and any money start collecting that and, and, I, and I'm and I'm not saying I'm not responding affirmatively to your implication that that's the only correct way to do it it's not and you know that I know it's not the only way but this is not very transparent to the residents of the city there is several steps to this this is only the beginning step yeah. and so I appreciate where they were saying it wasn't on the website. I'm following the protocol that we've always done, the way the attorney walks us through these special assessments. Um, so the first part of it is we ask our assessor to go through and at the $65 that was recommended and that, that how much the district would um, collect, it's $66,950. And then if after the public hearing, if all agrees, there's a second public hearing that is held with more details, a list of exactly every unit that would be charged, how much if there, the public would want to view that, that will be available um, before the next public hearing. And in that, um, that, the following public hearing after it was done, then council resolves, um, they they set how many years that would be applied to the special assessment. And that's what Mayor Hammond is talking about right now. Right. This was a 10-year special assessment at 45, this last one, and is expiring. And so if you did, if there was a possibility that you planned on putting it to a vote, I believe the next election would be in August or November that would be available for a special. Um, but um, the city would pay the whole cost for that election that because mean? it's our special me our well, how much is that run to I think people are here outside it's that pretty expensive we're looking at it for the whole process about five thousand yeah that's a, to me that's a waste of money you're talking about you're you're not talking about special election that's what he's asking I think right yeah it's also a special election to call a special election by the city, it would cost the city about five thousand okay. to do it. Sorry, it should not have been here. No, that's all right. I, I think uh, you know, obviously covering that municipal. Did you count uh, Village Burner? Mm -hmm. That's Okay, I got the <laughs> um, I forgot about them. Um, in, in in going through this, all of the other municipalities do it the same way, and um, the way I understand it, tonight's meeting is just to set up the district. That's mm -hmm. it, and then from there would be. Uh, the, um, the the dollar amount fossil for approval. Yeah, you know, that, 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 like I said, I've been through this process several times with other communities, municipalities. So um, and I know that that's how it works. The village of Morris used to do it by millage, which is definitely not fair because uh, they decided, okay, well we need this much money because we have this many households, so we'll uh, we'll do it by vote by millage. So a guy that has a house like yours. You're going to pay $150 a year for ambulance, and somebody that has a house that's you know taxable value of $20 or $20,000, they're only going to pay six bucks. You know, so I don't think that's completely fair. The other reason why it's set by household or unit is because uh, the farmer or the property owner, uh, there's only two people living in that farmhouse, but he owns you know 500 acres. Put that on a taxable value, he's paying a lot of money for just two people. When the guy lives across the road has a half an acre with two people and he's only paying, you know, very very little. So uh, that's why household unit unit is a better way to do it because uh, it's more fair to everybody, no matter how big your house you live in or how little the house is or how many people live in the house. It does not. Like I said, the apartment buildings it's per apartment. Um, trailer park it's per trailer. Uh, businesses I think as five full time employees is is a unit. Uh, churches, schools, they don't get charged at all. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure we can. Not that I want to anyways, but um, but it's just about everybody paying equally, no matter what your um, 
circumstances are, I guess is the way. Well, I get a lot of questions like, well, I don't use the, I've never used it. Well, if we don't have this assessment, I've already, I've already said what our call volume is, and we would collect around 600,000. Um, so see, that's all we would collect. And if we didn't have the assessment for household, we can't run the ambulance. So um, um, if we said, okay, well, you've never used the ambulance, here's your $45 back, we would never know how much money we need. We need to be able to budget ahead of time. Everybody, everybody understands that. But, and then the middle of your budget, you get an extra 20 bucks a year. You know, that's not a good thing. I have a question for you guys. Yeah. The 10% is 10% of the $65, so we're talking $6.50. And then the next year, you're 10% of the 6650 or whatever. Okay. So we can look at it a different way, and I appreciate both of you coming in. Um, and the reason I got on council or came is because I started coming to council meetings about a year and a half ago, and I want to get involved. So I came for the same reason all about my taxes. But if you look at it, $45 for 20 years or raise it $20, it's a dollar a year. So I understand, I feel your pain, believe me. Right, it. right. I do. But I look at it as a, hopefully got rid, I don't need the service, but you never know. I might fall down the stairs and break my neck and I need them to come to my house. You the know, best way to my child or somebody, you know. So the best way to look at it is an insurance policy. That's what it really is. I mean it ensures that you're gonna have ambulance service available. Um, it, it's not uncommon for, it's very uncommon now that we have three trucks, but if all three of our trucks are out, it's possible you might get a different ambulance service coming here. It's called mutual aid. We go to other districts, um, not very often, just because they can cover their own area pretty well, but us in Owasso City, we do a lot of, uh, a lot of calls outside of our own municipality. They do more than we do, but, um, because... You know, we're pretty strong in staffing. I think we have a great program for retirement. Um, the benefits, the insurance is what it is. You know, I get the same one. Um, so we have some pretty good benefits. Wages aren't that great, but luckily we have people to stay. Just had to hire uh, five new people for the drain truck. And, um, but again, Duran's paying for that. It's pretty, it's pretty much going to break even with calls, and uh, and that's all we want to do is just break even. We throw all money over to buy new ambulances when we have to. An ambulance costs one hundred and sixty thousand. Um, try to buy one every three or four years because they get a lot of miles on them. We go to Lansing, Flint, you know, sometimes down to Henry Ford and um, Owasso most of the time, but uh, so they get a lot of miles on them. So we try to we put money around toward that. So private companies have a lot of CEOs and and people like that that make a lot of money. We don't. We don't have that. And, I, and another thing about the private versus um, municipal is the transparency. You want to see our budget? Here it is. Uh, the city council has two members on our board, but I think you also get a copy of the reports every month in the mail. That has every bill we paid. It has all of our revenue. It has everything on it. So uh, complete transparency because we're a municipality of our own, so we have to. We have to, and we are owned by the city of Perry and Perry Township. Sort of. <laughs> I, to say owned, that's a stretch, but control by it is a better way to say it. Anything Anybody else? Anybody else have questions for Guy? Or any comments you'd like to make? Yeah, so I appreciate it, Guy. Thank you for $20 is a very small increase for what we're considering here, right? Sure. So thank you. Yep. Right. Um, well, that, I think it helps clear up a question about how much because you didn't know what's paying out, probably. Right. Right. And so I put myself in the boat of most residents, and and I think that this is just a, a suggestion, right? If we're going to move this forward, and, and more of our residents are going to read this letter and agree to it, let's be transparent. Tell them what a unit costs. Twelve thousand units times sixty-five dollars is what seven hundred eighty thousand dollars, right? Yep. Somewhere in that neighborhood. That's the whole. Right. Yeah. But let them know that. Why should I have to go hunt for that information? It shouldn't. Be no. transparent. People, people will gladly pay. And, that, and that's on. And that's on our annual budget. The number of households and how much money it is. Sure. And, I, and anybody just my numbers on the website. Email. Email me a, a request for our annual budget, and I, I'll forward it to you right away. No matter who you are. I, I completely understand, but when I received the letter in the mail, yeah, yeah, I get I, it. I, I'm, I just got mine today. I'm just saying. It, <laughs> it, it, I seriously. It, it it leads to trust, and it leads to the next time we have something of this nature to come up, 
the city of Perry residents will read things and they'll say, I expect, I have an expectation of what it is. Right now the expectation is, I have to come to city council at 7.15 and find out any more information. Otherwise, I'm just going to see an increase and I don't know what it is. It's just a suggestion from a resident, but... And we appreciate your suggestion, we appreciate your comments. And honestly, I apologize that you didn't get the information that you needed to avoid having to go out in this snowstorm oh, tonight. I don't mind. <laughs> don't live far but let, let, let me just share this, if you don't mind. Guy, you can go ahead and sit down, okay. because I'm on a roll now. You're going to roll. This, this is the letter that came to me from our then attorney, Tom Bridges. It's dated December 28th. Dear folks, the 10-year special assessment for ambulance service, which the city established in 2010, has expired with the collection of the July 1st, 2020 tax billing. If the city desires to continue collecting a special assessment for ambulance service, the legal process to be followed should commence fairly soon, as it is a cumbersome and time-consuming process, and must be completed in time for the assessor to spread the assessment on the July 1st, 2020 tax billing. The law has certain requirements that must be followed, which include two public hearings, notice of the public hearings must be mailed and published, the clerk is aware of the time frames and has been provided with the notices, resolutions, etc. The number of years for the assessment must be set by the city council after the second hearing. The assessment can continue to a maximum period of 15 years. The amount of the assessment can increase by 10% when it is reviewed yearly. Briefly, the requirements are as follows. One, the city must have an estimate in writing for public view of the cost of ambulance service for one year. And the anticipated revenue from the special assessment at the time notice of the first hearing is given. Two, the city must set a time for a hearing on the estimated cost and the question of creating a special assessment. And that would happen tonight. We would set another hearing. Three, if the city decides to proceed after the first hearing, the second hearing is set to hear objections to the distribution of the special assessment levy. After this hearing, the council sets the amount of the assessment and sets the number of years. So truly to say to you, how much is the assessment and the letter that was going out to tell you about a special hearing, we don't know how much. We know what they're asking for, but we don't know. But in light of transparency and hearing both of your comments, perhaps we should have sent a copy of this letter, a copy of this letter, and a copy of the proposed assessment indicating what amounts being asked for and how that would shake out to each household. So knowing that's what people would prefer to have in the future, we'll try to do that. It seemed more cost effective to just let you know there's a special hearing and come on and find out what it's about. We have it posted at City Hall as to what the numbers are. That's what the law required. So we, we perhaps in error, stopped at what the law required and didn't say about what would the residents like, not just what does the law require. It does go on in number four in this letter from Mr. Bridges and say, the city may place the issue on the ballot, but it's not required. The city must place the issue on the ballot if 10% of the owners of the properties assessed petition to have it placed on the ballot. So there were our instructions, and that's what we did. Perhaps we fell short of that, and my apologies to you. That's a great um, we did what we thought was right at the time. There was no intention to mislead or not inform. That's not why we're here. That's not why we come here two nights every month to do what needs to be done to keep the city running. We are honest and open people. Our cell phones are posted on the website. 
feel free to give me a call anytime after 8 a.m. and up till 9 p.m. <laughs> and we'll give you what you need. We'll tell you what you need to know. We may have to look it up, but we'll find it. And I'm so glad you both and all of you came tonight. And if there are no other comments, then we will close the hearing based on the fact that we have to set the next hearing date. Am I saying that right, Devin? Because I'm new. I just took office the 1st of December, so I have to ask everything. We're going to close the public hearing, and it is under new business to, okay. to, for the council to okay. consider that, to set the public hearing. Okay, so we're going to close the public hearing. <coughs> now close. What time, and please? it is uh, 7.58. Thank you. And then further into our business, uh, of new business, that's where we would possibly set a res or resolve to set a public hearing to create that new ambulance system. So it's an involved process, but we would love to have you come back anytime. Thank you very much. And you're too, Steve. Okay, let's see, where were we? John, where'd you go? Okay, so I think we finished up as far as Mr. and Mrs. Frisch. We're going to send that letter out. Were we going to talk any more tonight about um, the restaurant issue, water issue? Was that going to be a topic of discussion? Specific or in general? Specific or in general? General, I would say. Um, well, uh, I don't really have any more to add to it, um, other than any changes to billing would have to be done through ordinances um, based on, uh, I, I guess it's governor executive orders if you decided to do it like that, if I'm on the right, the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, as far as capacities and change in sewer units, um, you know, I don't, it's, but it's going to, you know, I mean, we're, we're kind of a, almost a year into this deal. Um, you know, it wasn't up to me to, you know, change stuff, right. you know, in the middle of budgets and whatnot. I understand, um, you know, I, I do believe there was help out there or funds from the state and federal government levels. Um, but, you know, I think everybody lived through the same thing in various ways, uh, so. Mindy, um, John and I, Matt, we discussed Frisch's situation and we also discussed Amy's uh, diner downtown because at the last meeting, um, uh, Mr. Coffee asked for some consideration for a break on their water and sewer at the restaurant. Um, and we, we met for two hours. I mean, we looked at it every way that we could think to look at it. If a restaurant was going to change from having inside seating to take out only, there's provision in the ordinance because that's billed differently. So if she was gonna make that change, her water sewer would be built differently because she wouldn't be uh, charged for inside seating. That's, it's more. Um, but that wasn't the case. I called and talked specifically to Mr. Coffee about that and that's not what they want to do. If we were to adjust the bill based on 25% capacity, that's a, something we thought about, talked about, but said, gee whiz, if we made all that change in her billing for only 25% capacity instead of full capacity, then what happens next month when they're 50%? And then what happens in three months when the numbers go up again and they get shut down? Then it has to be changed again. So, uh, you know, I'm not saying it has to be easy. We're certainly willing to work with people, but we said, 
let's continue to look at the possibilities. Maybe, maybe there's something that we can do to help the small, locally owned restaurants a little bit. So we're continuing to look at that. Again, we have to ask the attorney what we are allowed to do and not allowed to do. So we're looking at that possibility. But I don't know what else we can do. If anybody has suggestions that are specific, send them to me and give me your name and your reply phone number and I'll, we'll talk. Anybody else have comments about that? Thank you, John. Do we have other department head reports? I do. Okay. Police Chief Kyle. Good evening, everyone. Uh, just a quick rundown of uh, recent activity, uh, at least from my perspective. I've been working on the budget, and unfortunately, this is the year that we replace our bullet resistant vests. I have a preliminary quote right now. There's some details to go over, but uh, we're looking at between three and four thousand dollars to replace those. Uh, those are on a five-year cycle as far as the warranty goes. Um, I personally believe they probably last longer than that, the way they seal up the uh, material now. But uh, anyway, uh, I have been looking at a federal uh, Department of Justice grant. It's called the Bullet proof vest program. I don't like saying bulletproof because it's not bulletproof, they're bullet resistant. So that being said, uh, the program uh, cycle opens in April, I believe, so we can start looking at that. So hopefully that can take care of uh, most, if not all, of the funding for that, but uh, no guarantees. And after the last year we've all experienced, I'm not going to make any promises uh, about funding for that program. Uh, the other thing regarding my budget is uh, we are up for another vehicle. Uh, that should not incur any great additional cost to the budget. Uh, it's just part of our uh, monthly fee that we pay. Uh, we're on a three year cycle for a new vehicle and this is the third year. So it's just time to rotate one out. Uh, we can discuss that, we own that vehicle that we would rotate out. So uh, John and I would have a discussion on uh, any public works needs or anything along those lines before we went and auctioned it off. But uh, at this point, the 2014 that I am currently driving would probably be cycled out. But we have some options, so we'll see where that goes. Um, because of that bulletproof vest program, uh, I had to take a look at our use of force policy that we have for our officers and how they engage people who don't want to comply with verbal commands. And a part of the new standards that have come out uh, last year, mostly from which uh, President Trump put an executive order out in June uh, requiring some of these new uh, details in the policies, I uh, went through and uh, made sure that we had all of that uh, in place for our new policy rollout. We've rolled that out, and so hopefully we would then be eligible for this federal grant for the Bill of Proof Vests. Uh, but that took some work and took some time. I actually had to forward that to the Michigan Association of Chiefs of Police for review so that they can give it their blessing so that they can move it on to the Department of Justice then. Um, what else? Uh, the middle of January, we had a truck taken off of Keeney Street, and uh, it was warming in the morning, and uh, he literally watched it pull out of his driveway and go down the street. And we had an officer one block away, and we never saw that vehicle again. It actually drove towards the school. Uh, I was getting an oil change just so I, I was, my vehicle was up in the air without the drop of oil in it at the time this club came out. So the timing couldn't have been any worse. Uh, that being said, uh, Sergeant Monroe was right around the corner. He circled the block several times and we never found that vehicle again. The good news is I walked into uh, a report this morning stating that Grand Lash had come in contact with the vehicle 
The driver decided not to comply with the lights and sirens, took off 100 miles an hour through Grand Ledge, uh, ditched the vehicle, uh, canine tracked the subject, found him, was trying to steal another car. Uh, anyway, he's in custody. We do have the truck uh, secure. We don't have it back yet. We have to process that ourselves tomorrow for evidence. But uh, good news is we got the truck back. So hopefully uh, the owner can have it back by tomorrow. And the previous day, so today's Thursday, I got a phone call Tuesday afternoon. No, I'm sorry, Wednesday afternoon from Battle Creek saying they recovered the stolen handgun that we had stolen back in 2019. Resident called and said that the uh, gun was in the car, it's not in the car. I don't know why you never keep a gun in a car, but you don't do that, people. Anyway, um, it was taken and they recovered it in an incident they had. I've yet to see their report on that. Um, but uh, anyway, once they go through all their legal proceedings for whatever crimes they have done in Battle Creek, I would imagine that we'll have that gun back to the owner as well. Uh, last but not least, uh, I did want you folks to be aware that uh, the mayor and I have sat down with uh, the president of the village of Morris and their chief of police uh, a couple of times. Uh, it has come to our understanding that uh, while we furloughed our employees citywide through June and July, uh, they did the same. Uh, after the end of July, August 1 through January 31st, they continued to furlough their employees to save money on the village. Well, due to our mutual aid agreement that we have with them, that was on the backs of our officers, our Perry officers going to the village of Morris. There was a breakdown of numbers and all of that, but I felt the need to let you know that they did that for the end, through the end of 2020, and they have decided to continue that through March of 21, and then review that as a village and see if they want to continue to furlough their employees. At this point, they are furloughing eight hours per week per employee. They only have two. So that's 16 more hours per week that we potentially have the chance to go over there and cover their village. I felt that you folks needed to have that information in front of you. Other than that, I do not have anything further or anything more. Do you have any questions for me? How do you recommend we handle that, Kyle? I'm sorry? How do you handle we recommend How do you recommend that we address the issue for additional hours? I don't necessarily have a recommendation. Uh, we did sit down collectively, the four of us, and talk about some language change potentially in the agreement so that if they ever change or we ever change to more of a part-time department, either one of us, that there are provisions that we don't just carry the load or they carry the load, but defining that is really complicated. I've had a discussion with our city attorney already regarding this, and we come to the same conclusion. We all have come to the same conclusion. We don't know how to define our current status, our current hours covered, our current shifts covered, to say that if it changes from this, then it would be a breach of the agreement or it would need to, or it would negate the current agreement that we have in place. So I appreciate your question. I don't necessarily have the answer, but I did felt that it, it was responsible to pass that information on to you folks. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's definitely something to consider. Anything else? Thank All you, right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, committee reports. Can I do one report? I can't do one. Can I do a department report? Oh, you can. Yes. From the department to my right. Um, actually, this is John's department, but I do want to. This is. Uh, I received information from MDOT, and it's regarding the grant that. John went after for um, streets, and John, you can describe to remind them of what I'm talking about better, um, and also the engineer, if you want to remind them. And this information is going to be coming to you at the next meeting to review, and if possible, to approve the mayor to sign this documentation. 
Um, I've technically been working on the resolution that the state um, is required for you to consider and I have it in front of the city attorney to review the wording that I've created. So, John, do you want to explain the grant that so, I'm talking about? Yep. So it's an uh, MDOT grant. It was a pretty, it, I, if I say it was simple, I needed a little help to make sure that we capitalized on it. It was uh, 50 cents on the dollar, so or 50, you know, each one pays 50 cents, you know. So uh, the maximum that we will get out of it is 122,000. Um, so the combined total of the project was um, 200 and some thousand dollars. Uh, depends on how the bids come in. They're being bid on right now. I think we have one more week of open bid and then that will be uh, done. Um, so I did contact Wolverine uh, Engineering out of Mason because they had helped the village of Morris, uh, Bancroft, Byron, uh, a lot of local municipalities in Shiawassee County uh, in assisting with this grant. So um, they did help me uh, fine tune it and submit it to MDOT. That's all, all that stuff has been done, was done uh, last spring, I think, uh, early June, something. It was in last budget. so. It was in a, another budget than what we're in currently. So that stuff, uh, when those uh, contracts, this there will be a resolution and contract made with MDOT between the city, um, and then there will be a contract made with uh, the um, paving company and whatnot, and all that. And then I will, myself and Wolverine will funnel the information, the paperwork through MDOT in order to receive payment. So it's, uh, it's from my understanding, it's the simplest grant or going right now for, for us to get. So um, we have it, we've been awarded it. We're just working through the process. Wonderful, good job, thank you. And most of our streets on the passer report, other than a few of them that had been paved in the last uh, year, were um, in, in some of the worst conditions. So um, I picked streets based on where I figured uh, we wouldn't be doing any water main work in the next five to 10 years, hopefully. Uh, I can't guarantee that something may not happen because I've seen municipalities pave a street and two weeks later dig out a huge section because something happens. Um, so it's just part of it the business, so to have an underground utilities. Thank you, John. Yep. Thank you, Kevin. Mm -hmm. Do we have any committee heads who would like to report on their committees? Yes, I haven't done a whole lot myself personally with the sign ordinance uh, thing, but thankfully Larry has put together some things and ready to work on some things, so I've read through that. Uh, the hold up this week is me, so, but uh, we'll, get, we'll continue on that, so we'll have something coming to you soon. Great. Business Affairs and Technology uh, Committee has not had the opportunity to get together yet, but I took the liberty as a chairperson to put together a uh, kind of an operational outline of what hopefully we'll adopt as uh, short term and next steps to take, and uh, hopefully we'll have something to report before the next uh, council meeting. Great. Thank you. Uh, Parks and Property has set a schedule for a monthly meeting, One. and I know Devin put it on the marquee down by Carl, so and it had so much information it had to run three times. <laughs> you have to stand there. Sorry, I got three, wait three for my book. That's great. That's wonderful. Thank you, all of you. Mindy, you too, because I know you serve on both, all of those. Well, <laughs> I'm blaming him. Okay. <laughs> he did an awesome job um, putting some stuff together, though. Really. Yeah, um, give us something really good to work with. Great. We can move on then to presentation and approval of the bills. I move that we accept and pay the bills and present. Second. It's been uh, moved and seconded to approve the bills as presented. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I should have finished my sentence. Sorry. 
<clears throat> Moving into old business, we're going to talk about DDA some more. We did get some questions answered. The questions that um, were posed by Adam and by Mindy, we submitted those to the attorney, to um, Justin English, and he gave us, I, I think, some very clear answer. Adam, were you satisfied with the answers you got? Uh, yeah, I think it definitely, um, it, 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 I mean, to me, if I'm understanding correctly, it definitely uh, would negate or rule out any possibility of that current map that was drawn and would limit it to the traditional downtown, and then that would have to have a confirmation of uh, what he words the significant property decline, which if I'm understanding him right, uh, sounds like he moved to go ahead and start some of that. That's what I read. I read that the downtown would qualify, would be legally sound to, to say the downtown would qualify for the DD, DDA, but not the poor corner. Yeah, but, that's how I read it. Yeah, and the, with, with also the provisions in, in addition to that, that geographically, the traditional downtown qualifies, but in addition, the other qualification it has to meet is that there's significant property decline. Yes. Upon a factual finding, and so that's what's. Still that's still, I think. Yeah, I think that still has to be found through the assessor. Yes. I believe. Yes. Yes. I understood him. Uh, sounds like he is. Where did I read that? He's requested the information from the assessor and the building inspector, yeah. yes. corresponding to Mr. Bridges' re previous request. So that, that's what it sounds like to me. I mean, it would be limited to the traditional downtown, and then that's only doable per factual finding that there's property value decline. Correct. Mindy, did your question get answered to yes, your yeah. satisfaction? Yes. Okay. Bob, did you get a copy of this? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, I think we're at the point where we can discuss whether there's any room in the Planning Commission's plan um, for DDA to alter the outline based on the attorney's opinion. That is very possible. We said that could be done right from the beginning. Okay. And then, um, would you uh, want to move ahead then and have a workshop based on the new outline, or do you want just to have CIB? Did I say that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, CIB do the um, tariffs based on that property first, or do you want to do a workshop first? What would the Planning Commission like as far as moving forward? Well, I think that we've got the major area that needs to be covered by the DBA. So that can be done and the map can be drawn up on there uh, directly from what was done before, only just including the downtown area. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, rather than have somebody else do that, the Planning Commission could do it to reduce the expenses. Okay. We've got, we've got the map and we've got the borders. All we need to do is move them. Okay. Would it be prudent to talk to, what was his name, Jason, I think? Jason, Justin. Justin at CIV and see if his fees would decrease because the size of the DDA is probably half? Well, I might talk to like him. I ask him if the, if the size of it would alter the, the fee. Correct. And he said yes, it would. Okay. But it's not, he said it wouldn't be that significant amount. Now, if we take out because we're not talking a whole number of properties that would be taken out because there's some large areas like McDonald's and the truck stop and so on up there. To take those out is just one one parcel where if you had a row of houses, you got to take each one out. So, you know, he said it would reduce it if we reduce the size of it, but he said it would not be a significant amount. I'd like to get a, a new, when we get to that point, a new number before we commit to because if I remember right, it was $13,000, $14,000 for his Well, fee. I think that, that that fee is going to stay the same in there. 
because that's after the boundaries are drawn. Okay. So there's an initial fee of the 18, but the 3600 is what was being proposed and which is on your agenda tonight. And that was, um, CBI was going to um, take the, the actual parcels in these boundaries that was an example that Mr. Aki gave you. And he was going to give you a 20-year spread working with Joanne. What would, what would be, he would just work with the numbers that we're going to say, this is our boundaries, he's going to work with those numbers. That fee won't change. But the that overall could change. fee may change. In my opinion, if the boundaries change, that 3600 might be reduced because there will be less work into that. So there's two steps to this. It would, council had agreed that they kind of wanted to know how much um, would revenues would, would actually come in from the taxes for the DDA in 20 years according to the boundary. So if you're changing the boundary, there's a good chance that that initial work might decrease, but I would have to agree with, with Mr. Otke, the whole proposal, if council would decide to go with CIB as the people to do the, the process of becoming a DDA, that won't, okay. that should not decrease. I understand. Yeah, all okay. the steps are okay. pretty much the same. Exactly. Could I say something? Absolutely. Personally, I do not feel we should do go any further until we find out from the attorney if there is deterioration in the downtown. Um, that we do have some information from three years ago, but myself, I have to see how it stands right now to even consider the downtown being a DEA. The letter from the attorney, um, Justin English, dated February 2nd. Um, he's at the end of his letter after interpreting opinions. Please note that I've also requested information from the assessor and building inspector corresponding to Mr. Bridges' previous request updated from 2018 until present to determine whether any portions of the business district would qualify under Section 303, Attorney General Opinion 6558 and 6335, and that's concerning property value deterioration. Yes. So, so certainly that sounds like it's in process. Yes, they have both submitted their information mm -hmm. to the city attorney. But I, just, I don't care to do any more planning until we get that answer. And I also definitely would want that workshop with the every every property and the DDA boundary invited to attend and I would need to hear some commitment from those people to serve on the board it's I feel they have to be part of the board that's a flexible thing yeah. So, certainly, yeah. I would agree with Mindy. The other piece, I don't know if you're done yet or not, Mindy, the other piece that I would like to see and better understand, and I've struggled with trying to find any information on it, is what grants, because to me that's probably the largest potential plus revenue stream that whether it's the DDA or the city has uh, without just moving a money from one bucket to another, if you will. Uh, and I'm still struggling with what grants are we not eligible for consideration as a result of not having a DDA? In other words, you know, that to me that's another germane piece. Uh, if we can properly equip ourselves to go after some grants that we're not doing today without the presence of a DDA, it weighs heavily in my mind in terms of the pros and cons even with a smaller district as to whether it's a good business decision for us. Yeah, I would say the second all of that, I think, uh, maybe you know because really, I mean, even at this point, there's still a qualifying piece that we don't have. I mean, even though that, based on the other parameters of the law, the downtown would qualify for it, however, there's still this 
piece that must fit, and that's the property deterioration. Um, and until they say that, I mean, if that's not in place, then that's a di we're, we're, we don't even qualify for it. So, um, in addition to that, I'm with you too. You know, you'd want to see, because um, at the start of this, I was under the impression that there was grants that we do not qualify for unless we have the DDA, and everything I have seen simply does not bear that out. Exactly. And, uh, and that's not to say that I, that's not to say that I'm right in saying that, um, but if there's if I'm hearing the lawyer right, but if that is the case, then I'd like to see those grants or see other municipalities who have gotten them, what the criteria was and how it was limited. Uh, but that also doesn't mean even if we don't qualify for this, I still would say we should still do something for downtown and just yes. it may be a different route. So. Something else that keeps sticking with me is CIB and Roll Engineering both have commented about if we had a DDA, we'd qualify for all these grants. And if you don't have a DDA, you don't qualify for all these grants. But they can't name the grants. We've asked and we don't get that answer. And I don't understand why they don't know when it's a tool they're using to push selling a DDA. And you, you could be right, but I, but I have to say this. When Justin was here from CBI, I always say it backwards. Mm -hmm. When Justin was here, we asked him that question. Must you be a DDA? in order to get the grants that are out there. And he said, no. He said, no, you do not have to be a DDA to get grants. There are many grants that are available to lots of places. <clears throat> and to cite what grants, they change all the time. You know, grants, there's a bucket of money for a specific event, project, whatever you want to call it. People apply for it, when it's used up, it's gone. And then there's another grant, and then there's another grant. So some of them are for sidewalk improvements, some are for street improvements, some are for lighting improvements. So, I mean, there's a lot of different grants and they change all the time. So for them to say a specific grant, I, I can understand that. But he did say, no, you do not have to be a DDA to get a grant. But then Justin Horvath said, if you have a DDA in place, then you have the information that most places that you're applying for a grant to will need. And you can put that application in quicker, faster, more efficiently, and be more likely to get the money. Because it's first come, first served. When it's gone, it's gone. So that was my understanding. Bob, did you understand that differently? No, but <clears throat> from the private sector, uh, to look at it, municipalities and so on and so forth, if the city of Perry is not going to do something for their businesses, then the state is not going to do anything. Yes, you can put the grants together, but if you look in, in on that uh, Michigan, I sent it to you last time, MML, yeah. if you look at that, they list the grants that are given. And after a lot of them, it says DDA mm -hmm. or Main Street, either one. I think so, the key, though, is that the, 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 you know, the DDA is not required. Now, I would be the first to say there were, we should update the pasture plan of the city oh, because yeah. it's... And that's, that's what they want. See, and that's the qualifier that the DDA brings into place for these grants. And so if you have that done, you still qualify, is my understanding. If you have an updated, active, progressing, making, taking action towards fulfilling that master plan uh, is what they're looking for. Which is uh, what, as I understand it, some of the steps that you go through in <laughs> developing the DDA force you to, you know, to do that structure of a a vibrant uh, business plan as opposed to the DDA necessarily itself once it's done. It's driven some behavior. But I, I think Bob's right though. They do want to see any, any place that's going to give a grant. 
wants to see that the city and whoever it is that's asking for the grant are working together. You know, if they think it's just a fly-by-night group of people asking for the grant, there's less policing, if you will, of how that money's used if the city and that group are not working together. So I, I think that's maybe where that, that, it's not a requirement, but that preference comes in. Right. Well, Bob, you told me that Justin Horvath has told you that you have to have a DDA in order to qualify for these grants. He did say that to me. So. But I don't know, you know, like the mayor said, I don't know what grants it is, and I do not think the state would put in as a requirement for this grant to have a DDA. It would be one of those things that's inferred underneath it. Well, it, it bothers me when they say these things to individuals like Bob and then come here and they say, oh, no, not quite. Mm -hmm. That bothers me. I understand. And um, I don't know. Well, I, I keep looking. I looked at the, the site that um, Justin Sprague mentioned. It said nothing about a DDA, so I just, I keep looking for it. But well, shall we, as a council, say let's move ahead and get this information that the city attorney is working on to determine the the de deterioration. Yes, please. But do we want a new boundary definition? now or do you want to wait and get that information and then request it or can we work on them both at the same time i mean i don't mind if we work on both sometimes it's not going to cost us anything i, I do know this uh, you know probably if you speed you know, it, it probably not if you do if you have an electronic digital file you can move to the line pretty easy yeah however i hate to put you out doing any work until you know that anything because i mean if he comes back and says there's not deterioration of property values don't qualify then there's nothing I mean, the discussion's mute at that point. But as Justin Sprague mentioned the last meeting, it's not only the external, it's the infrastructure in the town and the buildings around there also. Well, I'm, that could be deteriorating at the point that the property values might be going up, but the inside is rotting out. You know, I understand that, but I mean, I, I, I can't, I'm not qualified to make that kind of determination. That's why the city pays the attorney. So, I mean, if he comes back and says, you can't do this, or you leave, I can't defend this in court, then my decision has to be made based on what what he's telling me. Yeah. I, mean, I understand what you're saying, uh, but if, if he comes back and says, you know, if you don't qualify on this basis and I can't defend this in court, I don't mean it to me, the point to me at that point. And I've always been at the understanding that it's based on your your SCV. Is that wrong? Your what? Uh, your SCV. Your... What's based on it? If there's deterioration or <coughs> increase in value. Well, you can have an increase in value just because of the economic conditions, and yet the inside of the building can be not good. And that would be Leland's area or somebody else's area to determine what's needed inside the building, or maybe John, you know, the, the pipes and so on and so forth. I, I'm not qualified to do that either. But if you just base it strictly on the SEV, you know, property values can go up all the time. And I'm sure that building across the street from City Hall in Owasso, I'm sure that that SEV has continued to go up, and yet the properties continue to go down. Are you talking about the Matthews building? The one they've been putting a new roof on? Is that yeah, what you Yeah, one of the yeah. roof fell in right. next to the river. Yeah. yeah. Well, still, even at that, my understanding is that that's how the laws are in. I mean, because that's it, it is based on the SEV, and so that's that's what, it, in my understanding, is that is what determines the factual finding of the property. Irrelevant of what the condition of the property is, if this county assessment is doing that, then uh, the I would suggest the building owners go have a meeting with them and throw a fit about their taxes because 
Um, if that's the case, then there's something, there's a disconnect there somewhere. But if the SEVs are increasing, then we don't even meet the criteria legally. Well, if you read the uh, Bridges report that English had a lot of that, mm -hmm. I read that it, it that also not just the SEV, but what things have been sold for. So if things have been sold for less than what their assessed value was, that has a criteria. Or if they were double what they were said, you know, those things. So mm -hmm. I agree that we need to not go forward until we get the information from the attorney on the assessed values, unless Bob can do the borders. And I know he's leaving soon for a few weeks. So um, that would be fine, but I don't think we can move forward with any kind of decision on the workshop or hiring anyone I, until I, we have that last piece of puzzle. Did, just to maybe put a little bit of light on this, I'll get my old realtor hat out of the closet here. Um, and I'm sorry, but I'm roasting hot. Uh, in 2007, 8, 9, when the bottom fell out of the real estate market here in Michigan, many people who owned, and I'll stick with the businesses downtown, those buildings downtown were upside down. They owed more money than the building could sell for. And some of them by as much as half. But did their SEV change? That takes two years to catch up. So probably not. So if you just looked at the SEV on the report on file downstairs, that probably didn't reflect a decrease. But having something on the market for the better part of a year and a half for under what you owed on it, meaning it's probably 20% less than what you paid for it on the market price and it still won't sell. That's a direct reflection of deterioration of property value. Even though the building was in good shape, even though it had been maintained and taken care of and everything worked well, the market was not going to support a sale price anywhere near what was owed on the building. And it wasn't just that one building that I'm thinking of. There, there were many. And there were homes, obviously, too. And that's why we had so many foreclosures on the market, because people couldn't sell them for what they owed. So I mean, that's part of that whole process. Because then, when things did start selling again, they didn't jump right back up to 2003 values, which was the highest we had ever. Um, it's taking a while to get back up there. So if you say, well, is the value deteriorated? Well, the question is, since when? Is it deteriorated since 2003? Yes, everything has. Even though we're seeing really high sale prices now in homes, we're still not seeing them in businesses. And that has to do with the fact that people that want to buy them can't get mortgages unless they've got 50% down, used to be 20, because all those laws have changed. So it has a whole lot more than just what the SEB says, or just what condition physically the building is in. So there's a lot of stuff that has to go into that. So am I hearing you correctly say that you would like to wait till we get this information that's referenced in the letter from the attorney yeah. Bring that back to council. We'll talk about it then. Mm -hmm. By then, Bob will be back from warmer climates. Yeah. And then we'll meet again, put you back on the agenda once we get that stuff. And you'll be available by email and by phone yeah. and stuff so we can keep in touch. And if we just use the boundaries that the attorney addressed that he thought would qualify, yeah. I think that's well. good enough for that. For that question. Yes, correct. Yeah, see, we need to answer two things there. One, uh, the boundaries that we have set were they were they legal and according to this? No, they were not. You know, you can't have a residential corridor to connect yeah. two business districts together. So I, that, mean, that, I mean, the boundaries that the attorney said the downtown area that he possibly could qualify. Yes. Those are the boundaries I meant. That we would, that use, we would use, talk use about rather it. than making yeah. a new map right now. Yes, I that, think that's we can say, yes. Now he's yeah. got to determine whether he's saying it's 
deteriorating per whatever the law yeah. defines that. Yeah. So. So under old business, we discussed creating a DDA. We've deferred any scheduling of a workshop, and we are not approving, but simply tabling uh, any discussion of approval uh, of the DDA based on estimate of tax capture. Would so, you like to table that to write off or no action taken and let these items roll to the next agenda? Let, let's do no action taken, and then once we get the information we need, we'll put it back on the agenda. Thank you. Is that satisfactory with everybody? Yes? yes. All right, moving on to new business. We have um, a possible approval of BSA training, and um, I might let Devin just tell you what that's all about. Um, we Thank met you, Leanne. She's here. Um, if you have any questions on um, what she's learning in uh, her third weekend, you can ask her. Um, but this is a key part that is planned when we have somebody coming in learning a particular area. It is uh, three days of training um, and she will get the benefits of General Ledger and the tax program. Um, I might request other BSNA programs, but that is further down the line, meaning anywhere from eight months to a year before I would give her that proper training on that. So I'm asking you um, to consider approving this training to help her learn all the ins and outs of these programs while Joanne is teaching her 30 years of experience. Okay. Question just for clarification, uh, Devin. Yes. Is this for one-on-one -on -one training? Because down in the fine print it talks about the uh, if it's more than 15 attendees, which would lead me to believe, do we have anyone else uh, that should be considered if it's a, a group setting, if you will? It's a group effort that they that BSNA is putting in. I want to say it was by one is virtual and the individual is. So there's. If, do you want to step up and and you can explain what they had told you on the three day training? would have been divided because when we went through this with Shirley um, it was I want to say it was four hundred dollars per program because we had her go through two programs of the training that goes into it okay and they went to class and Joanne and we sent Joanne and Shirley to class and they were 400 each and this is two programs so no this isn't including more people this is per person and then this what you're seeing here is for the appropriate pricing just to make sure okay per, per person then. so if we had a second person to pull go up yes sir okay thank you 
I move that we approve the BSA general budget program training for the new employee and also authorize payment for the amount not to exceed $25.50 to BSFA. Second. It's been moved and seconded uh, that we approve funding the uh, training for the hand for the BSMA training in uh, the amount cited. All those in favor, vote aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, that passed. The next item under new business is the possible adoption of poverty exemption guidelines resolution. Um, this is something that is a um, fairly regular event, if I understand correctly. And again, Devin has more knowledge about this, certainly way more than I do. But for them to, for an individual to qualify for um, an exemption on their taxes, for example, um, they have to meet these guidelines. Correct. And so Steve Schweiker, our assessor, has something to work from when somebody applies for that. He needs us to approve these guidelines for him to use. So when you've had a chance to look that through, if somebody is... I move that we accept and adopt the 2021 Poverty Exemption Guidelines Resolution as presented. Second. Larry Mindy or Adam? <laughs> Larry Ludd, who's seconded? <laughs> it's been moved and seconded that uh, we approve the guidelines as presented. All those in favor, aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, that passed. Next under new business, we have possible adoption of the resolution to allow taxpayer to protest to the Board of Review by letter, as opposed to having to attend the meeting. I have a question on that one. Just, mm -hmm. Are you going to set up a Zoom meeting for people who are going to protest in addition to sending them a letter? I mean, sending their letter in, or? Board of Review will be meeting up here in person. Okay, so if they they can choose to send a letter or they can come and meet in front. Okay. Correct. That's what, I, that's what I've been told. Okay. I move that we accept and adopt the resolution presented which will allow taxpayers to protest the board of review by letter. The vote and seconded that we accept this resolution regarding authorizing resident taxpayer to file protest by letter. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that passed. Now, the next item of discussion regarding zoning violation recommendations. This is what I brought up earlier when I was trying to kill time before the special assessment meeting. Leland had given me that proposal and um, we are still in contact with the attorney regarding that. So I'll just clarify that's what that is. We will say no action on this until we get more information from the attorney. So moving on to the next, under new business, possible resolution to set public hearing to create a new ambulance special assessment. I move that we accept the, and adopt the resolution presented which sets a public hearing on the fourth day of March 2021 at 7.15 to hear comment whether the city should create a special assessment district for ambulance service. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we set the hearing to create a new special ambulance assessment. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So that has passed as well. 
Do we have any other business that may come before the council tonight? I do. I've been, I, I think, one of the first, first or second meetings that we were at. I mentioned the council that I was working on a couple things. Uh, one was a radar detected speed limit sign that would tell you the speed. Um, I've subsequently been in contact with MDOT. We find, he finally sent me an email with their guidelines, and I gave handed it up to everybody. And then I also had a conversation with Chief Box today, um, and he feels that we don't really have an issue. And it, it's, MDOT frowns on having those kinds of signs anyways. There's, a, there's an end around, a wink and a nod, and there's ways to do it, but um, in my discussion with Chief, that if we're going to spend the money, it would be roughly $10,000. He'd rather see that be put in his budget. And I agree with him. So if we're going to spend that kind of money, let's give it to the police department to try to do something in that regard. Not saying I'm giving it to you yet, but... <laughs> um, the other thing I'm working on that I'm still working on is a proposing maybe to move the crosswalk from Taurus to uh, Ralph. Rolf, sorry, um, and putting up a, a switch one so you hit the button that's animated. Oh yeah. Instead of the flashing things that we have now. Now that has to go. I have to go in front of the school board and ask them if they see the need. I've witnessed people pressing down there more. My conversation with Chief Box, he has witnessed the same thing. So to me, it makes more sense. That is a lot less precarious for the MDOT than anything else. So. I will continue. I was hoping Terry was here because I was going to talk to him about the city. I know he's on the school board, or he was. So, any other business? Council, anything you want to discuss? Larry, what's on your mind? Pardon? I said, got anything on your mind you want to discuss? No, I'm good tonight. Thank you. How about you, Mindy? I'm good. Are you? I'm good. Wow. I said my piece a minute ago. Thank you. All right. How about you? You got anything, Devin? Is there anybody mm -hmm. else who wants to speak in public comment? Do we have anybody who'd like to speak in public comment time? Yes. Yeah, it's for right. schools canceled for tomorrow, so fire chief and ambulances won't be running. Gotta show you my smile. So my kid said, you get a snow day and I don't get a snow day. How come I have to go work every day? You get off the cold and I gotta work every day. School's canceled for two inches of snow. That's what time. Oh my goodness. They sent it out about 20 minutes ago. We used to walk to school uphill both ways with big fit in my pocket to keep my hands warm. But that was my luck. And you didn't have boots, right? No, no, I had boots. That was my dad saying it. So, I just had one other comment about the DDA. Yes. Uh, Perry Township has a DDA. The way I understand it works, and I don't want to get into a big discussion about this, is that the DDA captures any additional tax dollars after it's been developed or established. So, uh, tax increases. Tax increases, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone that collects taxes within that DDA can opt out. Like the community district library, um, us. As far as I know. For the fire service, we get a millage. Mm -hmm. Or separate, so we would be able to opt out of that. That uh, so we would still continue to get the DDA wouldn't. Yes, that's, that's what I thought. But that's my understanding. We probably won't do that. But if you were to include the corner, I have to opt out because that's where all the cash cow is out there. I gotta have that money. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Any agenda items we need to inform Devin of? before the next meeting and get in touch with her, if you do, because this meeting is adjourned at 8 in the